Welcome to Psychoanalysis and You, the podcast of the American Psychoanalytic Association. I'm your host, Dr. Gail Saltz. I'm a psychoanalyst and a psychiatrist. This is Psychoanalysis and You. My guest today is Dr. Maggie Zellner. She is a neuropsychoanalytic educator and psychoanalyst in private practice in New York City. She is the executive director of the Neuropsychoanalysis Foundation in New York and former managing editor of the journal Neuropsychoanalysis. Dr. Zellner received her PhD in neuropsychology from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and is a graduate and member of the National Psychological Association for Neuropsychoanalysis, also in New York. She taught neuroscience to the psychoanalytically minded since 2003. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So let's talk about this is an interesting overlap this area, this Venn diagram of neuroscience and psychoanalysis, something that I think many in the field feel is really important that we understand and that wasn't new in understanding. So what are some of the ways in which neuroscience data support or alternatively challenge psychoanalytic ideas? One of the most important things for me about learning about the brain is how much the organization and function of the brain strongly resonates with the psychoanalytic model of the mind. As Sigmund Freud originated, how it was developed by Anna Freud, Hartman, you know, numerous other theorists. So on a very fundamental level, I would say the vast majority of what we have learned about how the brain functions almost directly correlates with basic psychoanalytic principles, both in terms of how we think the mind operates, how on the one hand we're born with drives and instincts, and then on the other hand how our early experience especially shapes how we think and feel and how we behave. So that's one of the first and fundamental principles is that we are fundamentally instinctual beings who then do a whole lot of learning based on emotional and relational processes that then shape how we regulate ourselves. So that's one of the first principles. We have structure and biology initially, but that structure and biology is altered by our environment Exactly. And our experiences. Exactly. And so we're pre-wired to then get further wired by our experience. Then another fundamental principle that is really consonant with psychoanalysis is that the large majority of mental functions can and do happen unconsciously. So there's all kinds of subliminal perception, memory evocation, image generating that is happening out of awareness. So that's an, a second principle. So in other words, yes, your childhood is really important in how you feel and how you act in the world. And there's a lot going on behind the scenes that regulates all of those things. And then the process of analysis, which involves Trying to bring into awareness things that have been out of awareness can then help to update how you regulate yourself. In other words, as Freud said, you know, we want to be helping people to be able to work and love. And there's so many things about our societies and our individual families that get in the way of us being able to work and love. And then we would add play, actually, because play is really fundamental. That's one of the recent contributions of bringing neuroscience and psychoanalysis together is that it turns out that play is one of the seven basic emotion systems. So we really are literally born with the need to play, and play is a way of practicing and learning how to regulate ourselves, and that's a basic human need. It's actually, it seems like all mammals and even birds need to play. So that's one point of contact also that's very interesting. And the idea that we offer in treatment to some degree, consistent with psychoanalytic treatment, that these unconscious 
processes have the power to make us behave in certain ways that may be symptomatic, right, and cause suffering if they remain unconscious. Yes. And that is also consistent with neuroscience data? Yes. So now we're, we're, one of the things that's emerging in the field with models that have been put forth, for example, by Mark Solms or by Richard Lane and his colleagues, Lynn Nadell and others, is that people are bringing together especially two ideas that come from neuroscience. One is the idea of predictive coding, which comes from computational neuroscience. And one is the idea of memory consolidation and reconsolidation, which comes largely from the research on fear conditioning and how fear memories can be actually updated under certain conditions. So that's been studied largely in rodents, where if you block certain processes when a memory is reawakened, you can change, you can update that memory. So the idea of reconsolidation has become very exciting for us because we think that that might have to do with certain things that happen in psychotherapy. And the ideas of predictive coding have to do with the evidence that at almost every level of brain function, the way the brain is operating is sort of a synthesis between what we expect based on prior experience and what we're currently perceiving. And actually, that is incredibly resonant with Freud's original thinking about memory and perception. So we don't just have a blank slate where data is coming in and then creates images. We actually have predictions that we're then trying to match with incoming stimuli. So it's almost as if we're approaching the world all the time with a little bit of a hallucination that then we're trying to see, does it match current experience? When it doesn't match, we get something called prediction error, which Carl Friston calls surprise, which I'm putting in air quotes. And then that's a signal of, oh, wait, something happened that I didn't expect. I either need to update my prediction. Well, that's the main thing is that we might need to update our prediction or we might need to change the data that we're taking in. And so some people are using that as a hypothesis in the clinical work that to some extent that's what psychoanalytic work is about is paying attention at all levels which means bodily sensations patterns of behavior fantasies that come to mind associations that seem random but then really turn out to be connected that we're trying to tune into what are we predicting based on our prior experience so would a neuropsychoanalyst say that a clinical insight that is uncovered in a treatment is a biological surprise? Yes, indeed. We would theorize based on the real neural work of seeing what happens at the actual level of the neurons. That's mainly done in animals. And we suppose that those same things are happening in humans. But yes, so the idea would be that when something comes into awareness that's an aha moment where something is realized, something is put together, or something has sort of overcome, or you've reduced your barrier to letting it into awareness, that actually some new connections are being made in that moment, and potentially new longstanding connections can be formed. So indeed. I think it's often hard for people not in this field to understand or imagine that essentially, right, the brain is plastic, ever-changing, and that experience causes the growth of neural connection or the strengthening, as you said, like something that was maybe, I like to say, a meandering path can become a superhighway if it's used over and over and over again. So an insight may spark some, this is always very kind of blows people's minds, the idea that an insight or a therapeutic moment or change can cause structural change in the brain, as in the growth of neurons and Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's embedded in a longer term process. So we, some of us would say that the way that these processes in the brain get updated with repeated experience over time, generally speaking, is connected to the idea of working through. 
so that it's very rare for anybody to have an aha moment or an insight that really transforms their behavior from that moment onward. So what we normally experience as patients and as therapists is that there might be multiple iterations of, oh, I did that again. And then looking at what was I feeling? What was I trying to keep out of awareness? What was I predicting? And then part of the therapeutic process is being able to really have an awareness, ideally, the old prediction, here's what I thought would happen, here's how I thought I was trying to protect myself, here's how I thought I needed to behave, here's my prediction of the other person, and now here's some new data, like what it really feels like to actually try to get my need met in a real way as opposed to this defensive way. We're taking in the new data, generally speaking, over and over again of, oh, my therapist is reacting to me in this way, not in this other way that I imagined. And so there's probably multiple experiences that are needed to really transform. And I think that that's linked to at least two different principles in the brain. One is that when there are memories, especially that are procedural memories that have to do with connecting a lot of different bits and habits of behavior, it took a lot of time to acquire those behaviors. And now it takes numerous iterations and practicing to develop a new habit or to fine tune or update the old one. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is that almost any given process of self-regulation or any given relational process is composed of multiple components. And we could identify those sort of at a subjective level or a psychic level. And we can also identify them as sort of different nodes in networks or circuits in the brain. So you presumably have to modify things in different nodes of the brain, and that's going to take multiple iterations. The thing I wanted to add here is that the great thing about insight or any particular moment of change is that then it can facilitate other moments of change. So the insight in and of itself might not create change, but if a person has insight of, oh, I keep doing this behavior with one intention, but it keeps giving me this other result, that is going to support them in intentionally taking a risk or trying to do something different, for example. Because one has to deal with, in terms of neurocircuitry, something that moves you to something versus what in neuroscience we call inhibitory processes, something that in the brain inhibits you or inhibits another part of the brain from being active, which might move you towards something. Absolutely. So what about dreams and our understanding of overlap of what we neuroscientifically understand and our work in psychoanalysis? Yeah. So Mark Solms, who coined the term neuropsychoanalysis, he was originally trained as a neuropsychologist and then separately trained as a psychoanalyst. And when in the 80s, he did research on dreaming and looking at the effects of brain injury on dreaming processes. And then his findings, which showed that when certain circuits that are involved with inhibiting are damaged, that that can release dreaming. That's one of the findings that he found. Then over the next 20 years or so, there was a fair amount of, especially EEG work, where it looks at patterns of electrical activity in the brain and I think some fMRI work that, according to Mark's view, really strongly correlated with some of the basic psychoanalytic ideas about dreaming. So fMRI, just for people who don't know, is functional MRI, meaning uh, it looks at brain activity, yes, not it, just structure. Exactly, right. It looks at the level of oxygen in certain areas of the brain that's correlated with how much those neurons are firing, basically. Yeah. So one of the things that emerged is that in the dreaming brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is generally involved with inhibiting and with sort of rational linear thought, is relatively quieted down and inactive. But what we call the seeking system, the dopamine circuitry going from the top of the midbrain up into the 
especially the basal ganglia and the subcortical areas, is strongly active. During so, dreaming. During dreaming. Basically, the deeper structures that are the emotional centers, fear and anxiety and intense emotion. Yes, and especially also desire. Desire is strongly activated while the regulatory inhibitory processes are relatively deactivated. So this is during REM sleep. I think it's largely correlated with REM sleep, but dreaming is not strictly correlated with REM sleep. There's sort of some independence between them. So that's one thing that strongly correlates with psychoanalytic ideas is that when we're asleep, stuff is coming into our minds that is normally screened out and it's strong evidence that our minds are engaged in processing very salient information, which could do with to do with longing and goal-oriented things, and it could also to do with fear, for example. So then that correlates with other research, especially done in rodents and other animals and in humans, where dreaming appears to be about consolidating memories. So that has to do with day residue, the idea that when we dream, we're trying to rehearse and figure out what happened today that I really need to remember that's going to help me function better in the future. So, of course, we need to process what was scary, what we got punished for, and also what worked out. And then dreams are also for trying to prepare for the future, what might happen. What really lines up in using dream content to essentially have this window into emotional content that is somewhat a reaction to the day, somewhat a reaction to what the next day may bring that would be out of the patient's awareness and, of course, therefore out of the psychoanalyst's awareness, but yes, can be examined absolutely. in that and way. So, and, and it also then that all supports our working with dream material that we can really safely, I feel like we can now safely feel like science has very much corroborated the idea that what emerges in dreams is emotionally meaningful. What you remember during the session is emotional and meaningful. And then when you pay attention to the content of the dreams and what it brings to mind, what you notice you feel in your body, that those are all important roots into self-understanding and transformation. The dilemma, of course, and I think perhaps why people wonder, is dream interpretation real, is that how it's interpreted or how it's understood can be we don't necessarily know what the deeper process is in relation to an actual interpretation for that patient. I mean, we might be able to say something about emotional content. You're feeling a lot of this, but what it's really about or it means for that individual is the more challenging part. Yes. And I think that the neuroscience findings would indicate why it's so important for us to find, to really create space for what it brings up for the patient. As they're thinking about the content of the dream, as we're raising questions about, oh, you know, thinking about the, quote, grammar of the dream, offering possibilities, what we're wanting to do is open the space for the patient to sort of have their own connections made. If they feel like, oh, okay, this could be this, or now this is coming to mind. That's why it seems to me to make sense that dreams are highly personal. And there might be some universal things that almost everybody dreams about. And when they dream about them, it almost always means X, Y, and Z. But the personal meaning of any individual dream, I think, has so much to do with that individual person. So to go back for a moment to this Venn diagram of where it overlaps, where doesn't it overlap? Where doesn't it fit what we understand about neuroscience and psychoanalysis? Are there neuroscientific concepts we've come to understand that challenged psychoanalytic theory? You know, that's always a harder question for me to answer. And I think that part of it is that I'm biased because I'm interested. I come from psychoanalysis and then I started studying neuroscience. So I think it was I was always able to tune in more to anything that corroborated what I was already taught. But I think that it also is true that most neuroscience actually correlates with or is resonant with. The only real example that I have discovered over the years, but I'm sure there are many other ones, is the idea of the Oedipal complex. 
And Mark Solms has a new way of thinking about the Oedipal complex that I'll see if I can remember well enough to say in a moment. But the idea that we're born with specific fantasies or specific configurations that especially have to do with gender, I think that there's not much neuroscience that supports that. There is neuroscience, and this might be part of what I'm remembering from what how Mark has formulated it, is that the idea of the Oedipal complex, if we boil it down to an essence and sort of remove the gender from it, that has to do with a conflict between loving and hating or loving and competition, that it might be that that is sort of a universal dilemma that most children go through is that we're all incredibly dependent on and attached to our caregivers. And that has to do with the primary emotion systems of separation distress in the the young child, that we get very distressed if we're abandoned. And then the corresponding circuit in the parents, which is the care circuit. And we actually, both adults and kids, have both of those circuits that get activated. So on the one hand, we want to care for and be cared for by our caregivers. But on the other hand, we have a rage system that when we're frustrated, it gets activated. And then when we're angry, we want to destroy the object. So it could be that all kids have some form of, quote, Oedipus complex, where you're loving a parent and you're competitive with the other one, or you love a parent and want to kill them at the same time. That's a little bit more of like a Kleinian formulation of dealing with the good and bad breast, for example. But in terms of pre-programmed gender fantasies and gender predispositions, I think that those ideas of Freud's would be very open to critique based on neuroscience. That's one area. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So day-to-day, when you're seeing patients, when we're seeing patients, how does what we've learned about neuroscience impact what you're doing in your office? Or how should it? Yeah. Well, there are a couple of ways that it's influenced my work. One is that as I've learned about the different kinds of memory, and just I think most people know these categories now, but the difference between episodic memory, which is remembering certain events, procedural memory, which is knowing how to do things like riding a bike, and emotional memory, which has to do with associating certain cues with certain feelings, like a person who was molested by somebody who had a beard might then feel afraid anytime they see a beard. That would be an emotional memory. So we understand from a lot of different lines of evidence that those memory systems in the intact brain are very interwoven. So that's one piece that has really supported my work is that really paying attention to any piece that's emerging into awareness will probably connect to almost all other processes. So I can sort of relax a little bit and really trust in the association process of what comes up in me and what comes up in the patient that a lot of stuff is going to get addressed through these networks. Then on the other hand, the evidence that episodic memory can be quite dissociated from procedural memory and emotional memory. And let me just say briefly that, for example, the patient HM that most people have heard of, a man who had damage in one hippocampus and then he had surgery on his other hippocampus, he lost the ability to form new episodic memories. So he would meet with people daily or weekly and never remember consciously having met them before. But if he learned to play a game, he could play the game. So he could learn the rules of games And he acquired very clear emotional associations with people. So even though he didn't remember meeting them, if he had a good experience with them, he was more likely to think, oh, this might have been my good friend from high school, for example, or this seems like a very nice lady. I can just tell she's nice. So that dissociation has also helped me feel like, okay, on the one hand, reconstructing and understanding the narrative, the history of a patient is very important. But that happens also in parallel with changes that can happen through the emotional experience of the therapy, even if the patient is not fully aware of it. So I think that change happens on multiple levels. So that's another piece that has affected me. Another 
effect of learning about the seven primary emotion systems, which are seeking, lust, care, fear, separation, distress, slash grief, and play. So thinking about these as fundamental needs and capacities of all mammals, thinking when I'm with my patients, I might use some of this language explicitly, or I might just have it in mind as as we're exploring things. I'm finding myself more and more thinking in those terms, like how is this person trying to get those primary needs met? What are the ways in which they're not working? And what then it's a way of thinking about defense and resistance in terms of what's getting in the way of trying something new or letting go of an old attachment or in many cases, what might need to be grieved in order to try something new. So these are just, you know, different ways that, and often I find myself using this kind of information more explicitly with patients. And I'll just say one other, another piece is that thinking about the infrastructure of the brain has helped me mentalize myself Mm -hmm. more. And one really strong component is that it supports building self-compassion and having a sense of patience with the growth process. Because when we understand that there's multiple memory systems, that early reward and punishment learning is very deeply woven into us when we really understand the basic survival importance of our early relationships. I think it helps us to have patience with ourselves and patience with our patients for how long it can take to try to update those dysfunctional ways of being. In fact, I'm struck in speaking to you that it's a great explanation. It's a neurobiological explanation of why for many issues that cause suffering, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very short term and is actually geared to looking at specific behaviors and specific thoughts, cognitions, and not tapping into the emotional components so much. And also, as I said, short, may not offer the ability to make the kind of lasting not just change that we aim for, you know, on the outside, the what behaviors have changed and internal, what emotionally has changed, but actual structural neurobiological change that that does take time and repetition. Yes. Essentially. Yes. Something that a short-term treatment like CBT can't really offer. Right. Yeah. So, and and I'm sure, I hope you'll be probably interviewing some of these researchers or probably have already done so, but there's quite a robust body of evidence now in terms of long-term efficacy of psychotherapy that one of the really key important findings for us as psychoanalysts is that when people look at the long-term effects of psychotherapy, that psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapy are often associated with improvements in functioning that then last over years. And CBT can be very good at improving symptom reduction in the short term and then sort of decays over time. And I think that, I mean, my perspective is that any modality is worth exploring and that people could and should do multiple things at the same time. And I would even say that for depending on what the issue is, for some types of, let's say, anxiety disorders or really obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, not being rooted in reexamining the thought over and over and over again is very important. Yes. And, And actually psychoanalysis that might be based in examining the thought and what does it mean and the content over and over again can actually, for some OCD patients make them worse. Right. And I'm sure there's a good brain basis for that. And also another thing that seems very productive about CBT and that we might be able to be doing more in our psychodynamic work or supporting our patients and seeking it elsewhere is the idea of practicing, intentional practicing to cultivate a new habit or having strategies to tolerate the increase in anxiety and not going to that default behavior that we've learned 
reduces the anxiety in the short term. So the idea of getting support to practice something new, I think, is really vital. People get that from 12-step fellowships and from meditation groups and all kinds of tools. It would just be so helpful to, I think, for clinicians as a whole to be able to utilize the neuroscientific information that's emerged to not only use in treatment, but to use to decide who would most benefit from what treatment at what time. Yeah, for sure. Like. I think that over maybe the next 10, 20, 30 years, that will get sketched out a lot more clearly. What are some recent ideas in neuropsychoanalysis in the world that you find particularly exciting? Yeah. So I'll elaborate. The, the one real big piece that I've already touched on a little bit is the idea of predictive processing and how much that helps to frame, I mean, how we're conceptualizing what's going on in our patients and in ourselves when there's dysfunctional ways of behaving and illuminating or supporting what we've already been doing and maybe suggesting potential new ways. So just to elaborate on that a little bit more, so Carl Friston, who's a very well-known neuroscientist, he invented, or he was the mathematician who did a lot of the early work in fMRI. And he, as I said, he's argued that prediction is happening at every level of the brain. So it's not just at the subjective experience of, oh, I'm here in this room and now I'm predicting that such and such a thing is happening, but it's really at, even at the level of perception that the idea, so here's one very specific idea that I've just, that comes out of this, that whole model is there's an idea of precision, which has to do with when we allow data, new data to update the old prediction. Because in the intact functioning brain, we want there to be a proper balance between how open we are to updating some predictions and how rigid the predictions are. Because if you've learned, for example, that touching a hot stove is dangerous, it would be pretty good for that learning to stay pretty protected from updating. You don't want to just then go out in the world and be like, well, maybe some stoves are hot and other stoves aren't hot. But there are many instances where having learning about, let's say, how men are based on your experience of your one father or your one uncle, then that's too restrictive because there's so many different kinds of men. And so when you go out into the world, if you've had a good enough developmental experience, you're appropriately flexible in how much you can update your predictions. So thinking about unconscious, very deep relational predictions as being strongly formed and having a high level of precision so that that, to me, feels like it underlies, it really helps me to think about resistance to change. That there's a part of, it's as if there's a, the circuitry that's involved with that very core survival learning of what do I need to do in order to stay safe? with other people, that that is so vital that that stay protected and not be too updatable really helps me have a sense of patience for myself and help my patients develop a sense of compassion for themselves. You know, like, yeah, that deep learning, it's really wired in there. It takes a lot of practice. And of course, there's a part of you that wants to stay attached to this familiar way of being, you know? And so in that model, you may, may not be able to change that deeper, rigid. I mean, if you had a traumatic experience with a father, you might not be able to change it, but you might, from what you're describing, be able to set up new circuitry, essentially, that allows you to say, stop. Yes. Is this reaction that I'm having to this next man fair? let's say, you know, it's sort of another system, an auxiliary system that allows you to maybe have a moment, a coping tool, but a moment to say, wait, is this really how I want to evaluate this man or not? Yes, absolutely. And having a sense of that underlying machinery can really support that. It's like, okay, mm, I'm noticing this set of reactions. I'm noticing this impulse to behave a certain way. 
But now I'm remembering that I've talked about in therapy that I have this pattern, I have this set of expectations. Thinking about it, we presume, then activates prefrontal circuitry that then can a little bit put the brakes on some of the amygdala activation, for example, so that it doesn't have to just translate right away into action. And you can sort of go, hmm, okay, that's that old programming, but maybe I can choose to take a risk and do this thing in a new way. And then another piece that I find that I'm doing more explicitly is trying to create the space for people to really take in the new data. So for example, somebody who is really stuck on work achievement as a way to maintain self-esteem and to feel safe in the world, they have a real strong formulation of, I can't make a mistake, I've got to succeed. But then all of they have a work achievement and they might mention it And like, oh, so my boss said that that report was really great, but now I have this conference that I'm working on. I'm really worried. And I'm like, then I'll notice that and I'll want to explicitly invite them to notice that they kind of skipped over that, create space for, hmm, let's see, how did it feel to get that reward, to get that praise, to see if it can sink in on a deeper level. Then that often also gives access to some defense or some attachment to some negative internal object where the person then might realize like, oh, I don't actually really trust it when it comes down to it. If somebody gives me praise, then I believe that it's just a fluke. And so therefore I'm not taking it in. And then we can examine that. So it's sort of thinking about the brain networks is sort of supporting me to do some of these things a little bit more explicitly at times. Have you found in your in your travels and your teaching psychoanalysts receptive to this information, to this way of understanding their work? Yes. Now, one thing that's uh, about that is that generally it's a self-selecting audience. So the people who tend to show up to a particular workshop or seminar or conference that explicitly is neuropsychoanalytic are already curious and interested about it. The few times where I've been invited to give a talk in the context of a larger meeting that's really not neuropsychoanalytic, I can sort of see that there's a lot of, there's more skepticism in those audiences of either psychoanalysts or psychologists or whatever. But then I think that it's just on us to be explaining more how it can connect. I think that that's also a recent development in our community is that in the past few years, we've just really started to formulate and articulate ways that it really directly can inform clinical experience. And up until recently, it was more theoretical. It was like, hey, the brain is the infrastructure of the mind. We should all learn about it. But until it really made contact with what you do with the patient, it wasn't meaningful for a lot of people. I also think there's a lot of defensive discomfort with something that feels more like medicine, science, let's just say, evokes those sorts of words than what they're used to and what they've mastered and what they're comfortable with. And there's a lot of- Forgetting that Freud, that that's the model he came out of. Yeah. He was a scientist. He was- a student of, a physician of the biology of the mind as his origins. He was literally a neurologist. He was doing research on the neurons of eels. He was very interested in thinking about the understanding the infrastructure of the mind. And then he explicitly let go of that when the tools just weren't up to the task. You know, the tools of the early 1900s just didn't permit it. So what I would say is that I think also there's a very legitimate, understandable concern that psychoanalysts and therapists have of reductionism. Yes. And using mechanistic things to, quote, explain what's happening with someone. And I totally understand that. And my perspective is that these very core organizational and functional principles of the brain show us how vital relational processes are how much fantasy is involved with regulating the self. So therefore, thinking about how the brain functions as a way to inform clinical work does not replace any of the things that we would be doing clinically. It truly doesn't. 
I would also add that neuroscientists are also concerned about reductionism. Yes. First of all, because there's still a lot of mystery involved, right? There's still so much we don't understand, but it is so complicated. It is so incredibly complicated from the micro level to the macro level that they also would not be in favor of any sort of reductionistic approach to understanding this. Yeah. And of course, scientists will say that we have to be reductionist as a means of gathering Speaking data. Speaking each other. Right. And also, well. yeah, exactly. As a mean of, means of doing research, you have to focus on a couple of variables that can be controlled to some extent. So I, again, I can understand the concern, but I think that when if people really tune into what we're talking about in neuropsychoanalysis, I hope that they would see that by and large, it's not reductive. As we head toward the end here, what has been personally meaningful to you about neuropsychoanalysis? Mm. I think the level of metapsychology in some way has been the most personally meaningful for me. So when I started this, I was already in psychoanalytic training in the mid-90s. And then I went to a conference where Alan Shore was the speaker, and he wrote a very impactful book called Affect Regulation and the Origins of the Self, The Neurobiology of Emotional Development. And I listened to this talk, I think it was in about 1996, and I was like, wow, there is evidence that what happens to you in your childhood shapes how your nervous system is wired up. And then I became really fascinated by it. And for me, I think of it as a materialist metapsychology thinking about big picture processes that all humans have in common and then how they manifest in individual ways. Then for me, thinking about learning about what human brains have in common with other mammals, especially primates, and seeing what we can learn from their behavior and just that there's an evolutionary basis for how I feel and why I've turned out this way, I've just found incredibly satisfying at an intellectual level of just being curious about who am I and why am I this way? Who are we as a species? You know, what explains all of the fantastic things about humans and all of the horrible things about humans? So for me, that's been really personally meaningful. And then in terms of my own personal growth through my psychoanalysis, through other tools that I've used to grow as a human, that thinking about things both from a subjective theoretical point of view and from a materialist mechanistic point of view, for me, just feels like a more solid, fuller understanding of myself and my patients and my fellow beings. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I think that it will be very educative for many people who think about these very things as well. So thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. And now for some Freudian quickies. You sent in your questions for an analyst and I grabbed an analyst with an answer. Why did you become a psychoanalyst? Because I wanted to be a Jedi. <laughs> I was interested in psychology and began my own treatment along the way and discovered that the only real way to learn about myself was through the deeper analytic work and I wanted to be able to provide that to others around me. I was a clinician for a long time. Everyone I admired the way they thought were psychoanalysts and I wanted to be able to think like that. I became so curious about having been in my own analysis and how I was able to make some really difficult decisions in my life and wanted to know how that happened and why that happened and that it was so powerful that I thought, wow, if I could help somebody else do that. I was learning to do psychotherapy when I was in training as a psychiatrist and my teachers were psychoanalysts. My best psychotherapy teachers were psychoanalysts and I became aware that this was something that I was good at and I liked doing and that after a hard day at work, I didn't feel tired after seeing patients all evening. So I decided I needed more training 
And so if you want more training in psychotherapy, which you may know a little bit about, psychoanalysis is a good way to advance your training. As a girl, I could see other people out there in the world who were suffering, who couldn't speak about what was happening to them. And I knew that experience of not being able to speak my life and that there needed to be a place where speaking the unspoken, the painful could happen. And here we have psychoanalysis. Because I, in my training, felt like there were a lot of questions that were unanswered. I found myself often saying, I feel like there's more to this story. I feel like there's more to this story. And wanting to understand things at a much deeper and more intimate level. And so that was something that drew me to psychoanalysis. How do you know when to end a treatment? I think that's a joint decision. And oftentimes is the realization that the goals they set out to accomplish have been achieved. I mean, you hope that you get to a place where it's a conversation and it's a process and that something is worked through and it's decided together. That's the best case scenario. Some people come into treatment in crisis and the treatment is all about helping them get through the crisis. So that may be six months plus or minus two months in my practice. Some people, after the crisis is over, leave because they're not in crisis anymore. But some people become curious about what they learned about themselves and others during the crisis as a result of the psychoanalysis. And so they stay longer for what I call tool building. And so in my practice, people develop tools, takes them two to five years. Many analyses end and a person comes back at another time in life. And that momentary ending can be a part of the lifelong treatment of a person's personal development, whether they return to that treatment or not. So I think letting endings happen sometimes when they need to for a person is important. People can actually begin to have healthy relationships and are able to actually show up more as themselves in the world and are simply just less afraid of being who they are. I tend to listen to what's happening, listen to the person that I'm working with, and it's like a mutual decision. So it's not something I think that I really know. I think it's something maybe we decide together at a certain point. Can psychoanalysis help people have better sex? Absolutely. fucking lutely It's about becoming more aware and attuned with our humanness, and that includes understanding ourselves in a sensual way. Absolutely period. Even if they don't come to treatment wanting to improve their sex lives, it's usually sort of a, a thing that happens along the way anyway. Gosh, I hope so. If people can talk about it, then hopefully that means that they can do it. And it also, you know, it helps with intimacy and intimacy and sex are often very, very related. The psychoanalysis is an intimate setting where you reveal yourself and you take chances. Sometimes one let us say, side effect of the ability to do that in a talking relationship is people feel more comfortable in their sexual relationships too. So it can be helpful sometimes. One of the things psychoanalysis does is unlock doors, repressed or hidden or forbidden parts of the self. Then, of course, that which becomes open, becomes open when someone's having sex too. I would say it's at the heart of most of our understandings of what promotes healthy sexuality. As the cliche often goes, psychoanalysis is about sex, except for sex, that's about aggression. If you have a question, really any question for a psychoanalyst, send it to APSAPodcast at gmail.com, and we will try to feature it in a future Freudian quickie. For more information about the American Psychoanalytic Association, go to www.apsa.org. Till next time.